Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, first of all, there's nothing new here. I, I hope that's not suicide. I know we're going to disappear out of the room. But there, there is, I hope, a new perspective about you know, looking at shale gas. So, um, am I clear? Yes. So, I just published a book on this, or it's coming out on Monday. Um, this is not a push for the book, book particularly, but um, I'm going to show you some slides that, that illustrate my, my approach in shale gas. And um, there's the book. What's interesting about shale gas is it's a kind of subject that's made of loads of contestable issues. And there are some facts, but there are lots of things that aren't facts. Here's one fact. This is from a Nature paper which shows how shale gas has increased between 2005 and 2009. In fact, in 2012, it's roughly following that projection. And uh, in the States, they think that about half of domestic gas will be, uh, be produced by, from shale by 2035. But that increase in, in shale gas is a fact. You, know, you can't dispute it. Here's another one, though. This is from Gasland, a famous film. Methane and domestic water supplies from fracking. Is that true? You can read a hundred reports on the internet that that is true. You can also read a hundred reports and you know various things, bits of written stuff on the internet elsewhere in newspapers and magazines that say it's natural methane. And it's very hard to tell the difference. It's really hard, but if, particularly if you're not a scientist or if you're not used to reading really scientific papers. Here's another one. Cracks in the bridge in Blackpool. Uh, loads of people say it's the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, when it happened. Um, and loads of people said that crack was there because um, because of an earthquake from fracking, and you can read you know hundreds of r reports that say that. But you can also read reports in newspapers and magazines that say the cracks are already there. So again, it's really difficult if you're an ordinary person to tell you know what's truth and what's false, what's true and what's false. Here's a slightly more complicated one, which is um, <coughs> claims being made by the pro shale gas lobby that says shale gas result in 7.7% decrease in CO2 emissions because shale gas has been burnt in power stations rather than coal. That's an interesting one. But you can also read in virtually this, you know, a, a roughly the same number of articles in other newspapers and magazines and on the internet that say, in fact, because there are more greenhouse emissions associated with methane, with fracking, in other words, fugitive emissions, that is not true. In other words, greenhouse gas emissions went up if CO2 emissions went down. And that is another one which is very hard to bottom out. You can read both sides of the argument on the internet, but you don't really get anywhere. The way I look at shale gas is I've, I've broken it down in my, in my book, and each chapter essentially is a contestable area. So do shale gas wells contaminate groundwater? Is shale gas lower carbon than coal? And there's loads of them. Does fracking cause dangerous earthquakes? Does fracking produce dangerous radioactivity? Does shale gas cause subsidence? Uh, does shale gas use too much water? There's another one. Does shale gas cause volcanic eruptions? I mean, they do get more and more ridiculous as you go out. But essentially, you can break shale gas into these, say, 10, 15 contestable issues. And my approach is essentially in what I call, this, this, I call the science gauge or the science meter. Is that, they, it, you know, everybody is so pessimistic now. People think, how can we see which, which is true and which is false? It's impossible. There's just, there's just nothing there that can help us to make a judgment. Well, there is. And it, it's called the peer-reviewed paper. And it's kind of a bit dull, but essentially it's what scientists do. You, you, you all probably know this. Essentially, we write papers, and our peers look at the papers and check if they're okay. And that peer review is, is you know, generally thought to produce a very independent uh, you know, review and something that can be trusted. It's not always the case, but it's generally the case. So it's a gold standard in, in science, is, is peer review. And you can see, you know, the, the, the kinds of journals we're talking about. And essentially, those papers can help you to decide whether things are true or false. It doesn't always work straight away, but it, it, it does work. So it, it's not, we shouldn't be too pessimistic about it. And again, this is the approach I take in the book. So let's take one of them. I'm just going to talk you through one for five minutes. Here's one example. Do shale gas wells contaminate groundwater? Good question. You can hear both sides of the argument. Well, the best place to study is Pennsylvania, because that's a place where there's lots and lots of groundwater. Lots and lots of people rely on groundwater from water wells. But there's also a lot of fracking. So it's like a natural laboratory. 
So it's a place where you can really test to see if this has happened. You can't do that in the UK because there isn't any fracking. You can do it in Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, on the top left, you have a place called Dimmock, where there's a famous uh, explosion where a, a water well exploded. There's also lots and lots of fracking like this one here. You can see where Pennsylvania is. I'm sure you know it's in the northeast. I'm going to just look at three papers, okay? Three peer-reviewed scientific papers. This is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the most august journals. You know, it's a very carefully produced uh, journal. This is by the Duke University Group in the States, by Osborne et al. And essentially what the paper does is it looks at water wells near fracking sites. And what they said was they measured the amount of methane and something about the chemistry of the methane. And what they were able to do is show that there was high methane, first of all, higher than you might expect, and secondly, that the chemistry of the methane suggested it must be shale gas. And therefore they concluded that it's likely to be shale gas from fracking. But they had quite a small data set, uh, and they didn't know what was in the wells before. So they didn't know what the natural levels of methane were in the wells. So the paper was good in the sense that it concentrated on a particular problem. It was trying to solve this problem, but you know, it, 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 it had, you know, had flaws. Here's another paper. It was published a bit later uh, by Molosky et al. in another journal. They looked at some of the same data as that previous paper. They looked at the same data. And they also looked at historical records of methane in groundwater, in natural springs. And what they found was that there, is, or there are records going back to the 1700s of natural springs being flammable. In other words, having methane in them. So they established that there is such a thing as natural methane in Pennsylvania, in, in groundwater and water wells. But they also suggested something very interesting, buried in the paper, and that is that the chemistry of the gas suggested that it wasn't from the Marcellus Shale. And the Marcellus Shale is the shale that they frack, which is at about two kilometers. In fact, the chemistry suggests the gas is from shale above the Marcellus. And that's interesting, because how can it be from fracking if it's not from a layer that is being fracked. So it, it, it kind of plot thickens, if you like. And then the third paper, this is the same Duke University group, so they, they had a second go, having been criticised for their first paper. And they had a second go, and they looked at many, many more wells. So they tried to solve this, this problem of this criticism that they hadn't looked at enough wells. It was 141 wells. And they came back and they said, yes, methane contaminations are six times higher uh, for water wells with one, within one kilometre of shale gas wells. And that was statistically very significant. So this paper is really important because it's established, it establishes pretty well that there is a problem, that there is something going wrong here. You, you can't really doubt it if you read the paper. So for Pennsylvania, you kind of can summarise it, having read these papers, and they are all peer-reviewed, so you know, they have a, a certain value and a certain status. You can analyse it, and here I've made the cardinal mistake of making the shale gas well far too shallow. Of course, they are very, very, very long. I mean, this should be you know, way down on the first floor. Kind of thing, you know what I, mean. I have to do it to stick it on the slide. But there you are, you've got a shale gas well, and it's, it's, it's taking gas out of the Marcellus shell. You've got shallow water wells, those little white shallow water wells, and you've got natural faults in the ground. These are natural faults. So there's natural methane in groundwater in, in Pennsylvania, and it's probably coming up from below, and it's probably coming up things like faults. And you have got shale gas wells that are leaking into water wells. That's what the last paper said. But it's probably leaking from the shale that's high up, not from the shale way down below. So that's an interesting conclusion. In other words, the wells are leaking in Pennsylvania. They're leaking from shale higher up than what's being fracked. And what that tends to suggest is there's something wrong with the wells. The wells are leaking because they aren't properly designed. There's something wrong with them. But also, there is more work. So, for example, outside Pennsylvania, Again, if you look at the peer-reviewed literature, and if you'd have gone back you know, five years, you'd be hard-pressed to find any peer-reviewed literature because no one was doing any research. It's only since you know, 2010 and 2011 that academics have started to say, hey, this is a great place to be for science, let's get on with it. 
But if you go outside Pennsylvania, papers like this one, which is a very large study of 170 to 27 drinking wells in Arkansas, with a Fayetteville shale, and this is an intensively fracked shale, 4,000 wells drilled since 2004, and there's no evidence of any kind of contamination, whether it's fracking or the water wells. There's lots of water wells there, and they don't have any thermogenic methane in them, any fracking methane. So what the, what the peer-reviewed papers essentially are saying is, do shale gas wells contaminate groundwater? Yes, they do. In Pennsylvania, in a small number of cases, there's clear peer-reviewed evidence that that is the case. But it it's not, doesn't seem to be fracking that's causing it directly. It's something to do with the wells. Other areas of the US don't seem to be affected. We haven't got studies in the same detail as we have in Pennsylvania, but as they come out, you know, they seem to be suggesting that there isn't a problem elsewhere. So, you know, maybe there's a problem with the way that they deal with the wells in Pennsylvania. Maybe it's a problem with, you know, not enough regulation or too fast development. So, conclusions. My, my view is that we shouldn't be too pessimistic about all this stuff that goes on around shale gas and any controversial issue. I know it's very confusing to read all the pro and con, but there is a solution. You can read stuff that has some value because it has been checked. And it, you know, it does tell you. And so science is important. And it's not just big telescopes and synchrotrons and things. That's my small thing because I come from an applied science organisation. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's all. Great. Thanks very much, Mike.